Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Brian Fung. I'm an informatics pharmacist and you are listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. I want to throw a shout out to Kevin Yi, who introduced me to Brian Fung, who is an all-around great guy and an informaticist. We're going to talk in a separate podcast episode about that, but in this podcast episode, we're going to talk a little bit about his YouTube channel and the value that you can get out of just uh, some of the videos that he has, whether it's uh, deciding whether you want to become a resident, what to do if you don't match, uh, and you know how to... Uh, study for the BCPS. Uh, so if you're uh, clinically minded or you've got a clinically minded future, uh, Brian Fung's YouTube channel has a ton of valuable content. I recommend that you go over there uh, after you listen to the podcast, but I'll definitely have some links in the show notes. So here we go with an interview with Brian Fung, informaticist. Brian K. Fung, PharmD BCPS, is a medication management informaticist at an academic medical center in Rochester, Minnesota, and a clinical assistant professor at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. He received his Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition and PharmD from the University of Florida, and he is currently pursuing his MPH from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He completed a PGY-1 pharmacy practice at Sarasota Memorial Hospital and a PGY-2 in pharmacy informatics at the University of Utah Healthcare. Brian is board certified in pharmacotherapy and also received additional training in antimicrobial stewardship through MADID. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, we we always start with the same question just to kind of get a little bit of background. Uh, Your leadership, everyone's leadership road is a little bit different. Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, your leadership road and how you got to where you are. All right. Well, uh, it's uh, it's been a long journey. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, where can we start? I think I think we can start where I I had a lot of interest as a as a kid growing up in the kind of engineering world. I I loved computers. I loved games. And growing up, I did everything kind of like uh, techie. I worked on computers. I did computer programming. Um, and I, you know, I thought I was going to be a computer engineer when I was growing up. Um, and then I think what had shifted my, uh, next career path or trajectory, I guess, would be, uh, my grandma. She, she came down with ovarian cancer, uh, when I was in undergrad and that kind of shifted my mentality and gravitated me towards pharmacy, uh, mainly because I cannot see blood, but, um, None, no one in my family really was in the healthcare sector, and I wanted to do something to um, understand the complexity of medicine, uh, you know, to figure out what was going on and to help someone that I really cared about. So uh, I, I looked into pharmacy, got into there, um, got into pharmacy school, uh, studied real hard, enjoyed it, uh, did a residency, PGY-1, in pharmacy practice then was deciding between infectious disease or informatic or informatics and because of my you know previous interest in like com- computer engineering computer programming decided to go with a pgy2 in pharmacy informatics uh, afterwards i got hired to work on a awesome project uh, that was a epic implementation so we're implementing a brand new ehr across like 24 different hospitals and it's it's a fantastic experience so that's kind of uh, my story in a very very small nutshell. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, just for everyone, we went to the same undergrad just a couple years yes. apart. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> go back in, yeah, go Gators. Um, but tell me a little bit about uh, the undergraduate experience. What made you choose Florida? There are a couple other schools in the state. Uh, what made you stay uh, in Gainesville? Uh, where are you? Were you close by, or was it the, something about <laughs> the program that made you uh, want to go to UF and uh, hang around in Gainesville? Okay. And then I guess you're asking more so from why I went for undergrad or for pharmacy school? Um, why'd you go to pharmacy school at, after Florida? Because some people like to, you know, say, okay, well, I went to Gainesville for undergrad. Maybe, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go down to Miami or maybe I'll go 
uh, out of state. Uh, what made you stay in state and stay at Florida? Uh, great question. Uh, I think that there was a, a couple of reasons. I was hoping you were going to ask me an undergrad because it was for the girls. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, um, for pharmacy school, you know, I actually applied to pharmacy school in my third year and I only applied to UF. Um, and I, I, I got rejected. And I guess the reason, I guess I like going back to the, the original question though, uh, why I applied to UF is because it was one of the cheaper programs. You know, it, it's a well-known program. It was ranked uh, number nine at the time, and it was the only ranked program in Florida. So I really wanted to stay. It was a great program. I knew the I knew the people. I knew the friends. I was I was there for four years, uh, close to family. There was a lot of good reasons. I did apply to a lot of out-of-state schools as well, but I, I don't think at that time I was uh, how old was it? Like twenty-one. <laughs> Or something like that. And I wasn't mature enough to like really be a go-getter and apply to like the number one or number two ranked schools. I was just, I was happy. It was the rank number nine ranked school. It was a great program. And so I just stuck around. No, no real good, good reason, I guess, per okay. se. Well, um, I was 18 when I applied to Florida. It was a $15 application. And, uh, <laughs> and I went down there and because of my SATs and, and GPA and all that, they gave me an out-of-state tuition waiver, but they only gave it to me for two years. Uh, oh, so, okay. so I had to go back to Maryland. But to, to talk about how good Florida is, uh, just like the whole experience, um, I had a fraternity brother who applied to Yale Law and Florida Law, got into both. He had a perfect LSAT score, and he turned down Yale to go wow. to Florida because he was like, why would I leave? This is fantastic. So, um, you know, Florida – and it's also got one of the better uh, online programs it, it Florida, I know, is pioneering in terms of helping people finish with their PharmD. So a lot of reasons to go to Florida for sure. And I'm not just saying that because it's my, one of my alma maters. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I definitely uh, definitely miss it. Well, take us now to pharmacy school. So you're, you're in pharmacy school. Let's say you're around a P3, P4, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And there's, I don't want to say pressure from the faculty, but the faculty have gone and done residency. So you hear about residency all the time, top of the license, those kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what solidified residency for you? That, yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. I, I went into pharmacy school knowing very well, I, oh, I didn't know about residency first off. I, I went into residency, I mean, I went into pharmacy school thinking I was going to come out as a uh, pharmacist working at CVS or Walgreens, get your six-figure paycheck, get a sign-on bonus, and that was it. I didn't know anything about residency. Um, the program in itself, I would say UF, is very heavy clinically. Uh, you know, they prep you for the practicing of the top of your license, like you said. But it wasn't actually the program that sold me. It was very, very, very much so attributed to one guy uh, and his dad. And that guy is Ryan Holmeschild, and uh, his dad is Mark Holmeschild. They are amazing, amazing individuals. Uh, Mark, I believe, is with a drug company. I can't remember which one. Um, very personable, charismatic. And they both taught me about, you know, it's it's all about uh, what who you know in, in the pharmacy world and not what you know, but all about networking, a lot of things like that. But, um, you know, they're like, Brian, you know, you, you want to you, th there's a lot of potential out there. There's a lot of things we can do in, in pharmacy. And, you know, they, they knew I, I studied a lot at the time. They're like, we, we think you, you'd be fantastic in the clinical world. Um, well, actually, I don't want to say clinical world because, you know, re our retail colleagues do a lot of great, awesome clinical work as well. But, you know, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a big world out there in pharmacy. I think that was, that's the best way to put it. And they were telling me about all these things that pharmacists did on rounds in the hospitals. And I didn't know of any of that, that existed. And they taught me all about that. And they were the ones that really pushed me towards, um, solidifying my residency, um, uh, experience, I guess. Okay. Well, we'll talk about how good your P4 year was as part of your BCPS preparation in a little bit. Uh, but let's yeah. talk a little bit about why you became a YouTuber. You had some mentors that have helped you, that kind of exposed you to things that uh, maybe you didn't know about. I discovered pharmacy backwards. I was I was pre-med chemical engineering uh, mm -hmm. through my, my two years at 
Uh, no, I was pre-med chemistry, uh, and I think I'm still a chemistry major, although I got an AA from UF. Uh, but uh, And I was thinking med school all the way, and then I discovered pharmacy, and I got into pharmacy school before I ever ended up even applying to med school. So tell me a little bit about, um, I guess, how how your path kind of went. So applying to... Uh... Or why I got into pharmacy, per se? Yeah, so why didn't, why didn't you go on to medical school after you, uh, you know, you, you were going to go to, you know, you decided on residency, but you didn't end up going to um, medical school. You had a couple of videos about that, and, and you, oh. you, you shared, I guess it was more about the sharing. Like, you had mentors that shared about uh, undiscovered topics for you, and now yes. you're sharing with you as a YouTuber with other people, like, hey... Um, you know, I'm, some of you are just trying to figure out, should I go to med school? Should I go to pharmacy school? Here's a video. I can tell you what happened to me. You know, what made you do that? I gotcha. Um, you know, it's, it, this is probably more of a, um, uh, uh, darker subject, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but let, I'll, I'll go through it. Cause I think, you know, honesty is important, uh, and true for the matter. So, you know, just like segueing off what I was just saying, I was very, very hyped. I was excited to practice at the top of my license. I was, um, always reading, uh, guidelines and journal articles. So I was very on top of the literature going into P4 rotations. And during P4 rotations, what I think what I've noticed was like, you, you know, pharmacy isn't, the, for pharmacists, the ones I, I witnessed at least, uh, were not practicing at, at the top of the license as I had imagined, I guess. You know, you think of what it is like, but in reality, it wasn't like that. It was more like you go on rounds, um, the doctors, the attending, and then the students are presenting a patient case, and then after they're done, you might make a recommendation. You know, something like that. But that was not what I... I pictured, I guess I thought, um, it would be more leading. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I just didn't know what rounds were going to be like, but I, I guess that was a little just, uh, different for me. And a lot of my experiences was just that the, the pharmacist wasn't the final deci decision maker. And I, I really wanted that because I felt as though I had great training. You know, UF is a great program. I knew a lot of knowledge and I, I wanted to do more and I wanted to be the decision maker. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of shifted my mentality towards wanting to pursue uh, medical school. And then what made you put it on YouTube though? You know, <laughs> you're, you, you, you talked about getting a 15 out of 30 on them. You know, their MCAT. Most people don't go on YouTube to say, Hey, I just wanted to let everybody know on the <laughs> peak at practice test, I was getting like a 50 or 45, you know, you don't, you know, you're, you're being very vulnerable on YouTube. And I guess, uh, you know, what made you say, you know what, people got to hear this to find out that maybe, uh, maybe maybe they think they're the only one. Maybe they think they're imposter syndrome, things like that. Yeah, I I think um, it, it's well. I, I have a, actually I actually have a great post on this on my blog, and I, I talked about the facade of uh, social media nowadays. Uh, social media nowadays, just like what you're saying, everyone talks about the their achievements, the 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 highlights of their life, and everything like that. And I think it it leads to this this false. Uh, image of, you know, everyone should be doing the best. Everyone is going out and succeeding in life, but that's not the case. And I, I think that, you know, to, I don't want to perpetuate that. And I think it's important that we share our failures, which are just as important as our successes. Um, so I do want to put myself out there, uh, and talk about the, the places that I failed. So people are like, just like what you said, yes, there are people out that are like me, you know, it's okay to, um, fail in certain places and you can move on. So I, I think that's, um, my, uh, influence and kind of my, um, reason why I put a lot of my failure. I think, I, I think I have quite a bit of failures online, but, um, <laughs> okay. I think that's why I put it on there. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I took calculus one twice, uh, calculus two twice, <laughs> organic two twice, biology twice, and physics <laughs> twice. Wow. So if anyone's, uh, wondering if UF undergrad is rigorous, 
Uh, I mm-hmm. assure you, <laughs> it is. I ended up with a 99 on the pecan because I took everything twice. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but but let's let's kind of segue into something. You're the people that follow you or the watch the put the big numbers up on your YouTube views uh, tend to be talking about residency. So let's kind of shift to that. And and you didn't match for a residency, and I feel like. There's a huge fear, you know. We, we you you go into the showcase. Uh, there's you know thousands of people there, and everybody's thinking, okay, I'm going to get this. I'm going to match. Uh, you didn't. Um, what what happens when you don't match? And can you tell us a little bit about the video that you posted? Sure. I uh, it was a another very dark dark. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean this to go down this direction. You're like. Come on, man. We went to the same college. Help me out. That's that's okay. You know, you got to balance the the light with the dark for all the Star Wars fans. (laughs) But uh, no, it's 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 great. I mean, this was another example of vulnerability. I this is one of those things that I never wanted to talk about. Um, It's it's took a long time to talk about. But I I think um, in talking with some of my close friends with it during the time, it's it helped me get through it. So then putting it online, I think helps a lot of individuals now that's going through the process to know that, okay, they're they're what 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 do you feel like? What are those emotions and um what do you do if you don't match? So I I think it's this will hopefully help resonate with those individuals that are going through that process. But um about that video, uh, I think there's a couple important things to point out. And I think the first thing is just that um, it was a very humbling experience. And I think pharmacy schools nowadays have shifted towards this clinical mentality versus like the traditional roles. There's a lot of important roles in compounding, dispensing, uh, counseling. It's a very traditional pharmacy roles, I think, that we're moving away from and it kind of scares me because we're losing that side of it as well when we're shifting towards this clinical mentality. But because we are shifting towards this clinical mentality and saying practice at the top of your license, I think that we also get very arrogant, which was the case for me and why I wanted to put the video on there is I was an extremely arrogant individuals, uh, individual during P4, during re- – um, well, not, not as much during residency, but especially during P4 – uh, I felt I was better than the med students. I felt I knew everything. And this was like a wake-up call to me that says, hey, you are not the smartest guy out there, far from it, if anything. And that I I would I wanted to put that video out there to, you know, say it, it's important to be humble in your life. It, it it's it's important to um, be kind and just be friendly to others that that uh, other people that you encounter. But um, just just that experience, it was uh, a rough time. It was it was dark, didn't match. And um, what helped me was just talking about it with friends. Um, that was that was kind of it. I, okay, well <laughs> let's let's get you out of the dark place. Let's, <laughs> let's play the country music record backwards. Get there your you dog go. back, your life yeah. back, your wife back, your truck. Okay. Back. <laughs> and so you have a video with you pulling the you know, pharmacy BCPS certification out of the envelope. You, you, I, I, I thought you had, I couldn't tell if you had gloves on or something, but it was like the, you know, that movie where they, they have the Declaration of Independence and they're being very careful with the document. Oh. And, <laughs> so, you know, a, a sort of national treasure or something. But so you, you go from these kind of dark places where you didn't match and, and you, you've shown tremendous persistence. Uh, you did make PGY1. You did a PGY2 in uh, Utah. Um, so tell me about uh, becoming a B- BCPS certified. I'm not clinical, so I don't really know much about it. Can you first walk us through uh, why would somebody want to be certified? What what does that mean? Okay, uh, that's great question uh, again. There for board certification, I guess the easiest way to put it is just like it's that official recognition for a specific. Um, area of interest, just like medical school. I think a lot of uh, pharmacy uh, mirrors or tries to mirror what medicals do. They use medical, um, 
how do you Pathways say? Pathways or I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, as the model. So I, I think like this was their their way of saying there's ways to certify that you are the clinical expert in various fields. Um, and you can get board certified as a pharmacist in pharmacotherapy, which is just general um, overall knowledge of various clinical topics. There's uh, board certification in nutrition, uh, board certification in geriatrics, uh, nuclear pharmacy, various areas that, you know, some people would uh, want someone that's more specialized uh, to see that you are, have additional training. Because some of these areas are very uh, um, important that, you know, if you make that mistake, it could cause someone's life. So you, you want to be, um, you have the extra training in that area. So that's, that's a just general sense, just gives uh, employers, if anything, uh, additional um, comfort to know that you're certified in a certain area. Can you explain to me, so why, I guess if I hear an informatics pharmacist, I guess I picture computers and mm. you know, health records and things like that. I don't picture anything clinical. And so can you kind of help me with that divide that informaticists work on computers and how do they relate to clinical pharmacy or why is that clinical pharmacy certification necessary for someone that's an informaticist? Gotcha. That, that's, that's a very, very uh, great question. I, I think this is one of the things I always harp to uh, for students that are interested in informatics. I, I think first and foremost, uh, the reason is we are pharmacists first. Um, it, we can never forget our pharmacy roots or background because we will then become just an IT professional. Um, and that's, that, that's not the purpose of pharmacy informatics. The far purpose of pharmacy informatics is to be the liaison between our clinical folks or like our pharmacists and physicians and nurses, uh, et cetera, and then our IT folk. So we speak both languages. If we lose our clinical competence or, uh, clinical knowledge, then, you know, we become the IT side and that, that just kind of fails. So I, I think, um, that's one, this was for BCPS, one way to kind of force yourself to maintain because they make you do, I can't remember how many, but it's a lot of CE credits to maintain that certification. Okay. Okay. So, so one, one thing is, uh, it, it helps you, it forces you to, uh, keep up with literature. That's one thing. And then I think the second thing, and I was probably say three things, but the second thing real quick would be just that uh, commonly when you are an informatics pharmacist, you're presenting in front of a lot of folks. It could be clinical, it could be managerial, it could be um, non-pharmacy individuals. And BCPS is a very wide, probably the most widely recognized pharmacy credential out there for clinical pharmacists. Um, so I think it gives you that clout. So it's like, oh, it's not an IT person. It's someone that actually knows clinical speak. So it gives you that, just that additional clout. Um, it's, this is probably more of a, not, not a super in-depth, uh, reason to get it more of a shallow reason, but, 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 but that's a, the second reason I got it. I think a lot of people didn't think I understood clinical. So this is a reason just to say, Hey, I do understand it. And, and you then get a pin, right? So you can just, put yes, pin you get on, a pin. So. I wear the pin every day. <laughs> Make I, it easier. I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably why they made the pin, <laughs> just so people would just go, oh, you're clinical. We're good. I don't need to explain what, you know, hermetocrit is or what this is to you. Absolutely. So. <laughs> that is probably why, you know, and, and it works because they, they see the pin and then they know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I guess uh, maybe do take us a little bit uh, into informatics and kind of explain what it is. I um, have a master's, I just got it, a master's in human computer interaction. So I, I'm no, you know, cognitive psychology, usability testing. I can tell you why a web page doesn't work right or, or why a certain process doesn't work right. Um, tell me the EHR was supposed to be a savior and let's just say it gets a bad rap. We'll just leave it there where we could vilify it all we want. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the things you're doing to make the EHR better as an informaticist or make the user experience better? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a very powerful question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, and that, that question probably came out of your master. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Let's, 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 let's make it, no, let's no, make it a little, I, I, let's make it kinder. We don't want to go back to the dark place. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's a fantastic question though. I, I think, um, 
all, all of us, I, I, I'm happy to answer the question. Okay. I, I think it, it's it's important because it, it hits on one of the key domains of informatics. And uh, I'm sure you, you probably learned about it in your uh, master's as well is humans, factors, engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you know, class back you take, yeah. Oh wow! See, so you, so you, I'm not the expert on this topic. <laughs> so, uh, you know, feel free to just correct me whenever I say something wrong here. No, no, no. Um, so, like, they, uh, <clears throat> for me, I feel pretty strongly about this because the whole reason informatics really exists, in my opinion, why we push so hard for it, really comes down to like there was a pivotal study from the the Institute of Medicine in 1999 or 2001. Call to air is human. I know this one. They, like, they talk <laughs> I know about that. it. Yeah, it, exactly. And and it was a fantastic topic, you know. And it talked about how humans make all these errors. You know, there's a human error factor, and we have to have systems. We there's not bad people. There's bad systems. So we need to design the systems to uh, help uh, us help us make it better. So humans factor engineering. What I do and why I harp going back to the BCPS is. You have to know pharmacy first. You have to know the clinical workflows first. You have to understand the clinical impact of why a pharmacist does or do why. Why do they care about total body weight, ideal body weight, adjusted body weight? Why do they have to have see all these different values? Why? You have to understand the why. And when you understand the why, I think it really helps to understand how to design the screens you see when you interact with the computer. How do you interact with a pop-up that you see? What information is important? Like I, I think so. That's what I care about a lot is the design because I do a lot of design. I work with the end users. Like, what would they want to see? And I picture myself in their shoes because um, I can't just be asking them questions all day. I try to design a system that I would personally use. You know, so. That's how I try to make it better. I try to put myself in their shoes. I try to understand what they do on a day to day basis, and I understand their woes, uh, you know, and their happiness. What makes them happy? So that's those are the kind of things I try to do to make the usability better on their side. Okay, and I think you're talking about things like alarm fatigue, where there's an alarm for everything. <laughs> like which which alarm should be, you know, something that you know, kind of like the black box warning of alarms. Uh -huh. uh, and so there's all kinds of things that maybe we don't think about day to day. Where uh, if we kind of tweak this and fix that, then uh, it helps us all work together a little bit better. Well, I don't want to keep this too long, and I appreciate you being on. So just a couple questions here at the end, um, just to kind of. Uh, get some of your best practices to uh, kind of succeed down the road that you have. Um, on a daily basis, what's your best habit to keep your work on track? Mm. Are work you like on a list person? or <laughs> I, I, um, I, I switch back and forth, you know, to be honest. Um, I guess the best number one thing, and it's a good and a bad thing, is my Outlook calendar. <laughs> um, if it's not on my calendar... I unfortunately, 99% of the time, miss it. Um, I schedule in everything. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, brushing your teeth. <laughs> hey, the first person I ever interviewed uh, said, I was like, what is your, uh, you know, what's your hack or what's your trick? And she's like, I have to eat every day, yep. <laughs> you know, and something like that. Like I schedule my meals. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's valid. I'm just validating your, your, uh, your outlook, uh, to, to put food in there because as pharmacists, we don't pay attention to ourselves like that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, um, what's maybe the best, uh, career advice you've ever given or received? Uh, ever given or received? Uh, I can think of, I think two. And I actually wanted to make a video on this. Um, I think the first quite, the first tip was when I was a P4 student on my administration rotation. So I didn't know anything about operation stuff. And I, I was told as a student that, Brian, what we care for when we hire someone is your personality first. We can teach you the skills, the you know what, what you need to learn to do your job. We can't teach you to be a nice person. We can't teach you to be a hard worker. That that is what I look for when I hire, and I always keep that in mind. And that I think that's translated to be be nice, be humble to others, be friendly, don't look down on others, 
And I think that has gone a long way. And then uh, the second one um, is more so from a student mentality, but I, I try to apply it everywhere, everywhere as well, is I learned it from my ID rotation. Uh, he's a he's the reason why I got into infectious disease. His name is Jamie Kistian. Um, he taught me as a student, I was a P3 at the time, that when you're in the classroom, to treat it as a classroom. Let's talk about anything that's on your mind. Let's you can make the wrong decisions. Say say what you truly think. It could be wrong. It could be right. Whatever it may be. But we do it within the classroom. When we're outside in the patient uh, care world, when we're talking with physicians or nurses, we don't just blurt things out. Don't don't um don't just pull something out of your butt or out of thin air. You know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to, you know, you know. Look things up before you say it. But he's saying to do it in the classroom because it really starts to trigger your critical thinking, and that's how you you train someone is you make them think and then you, you change the thought process. So I, I thought that was always fantastic. And I carried that with me, uh, ever since then. And then last question, what inspires you? Uh, a lot of, a lot of things inspire me. <laughs> I, I think that if there's one thing that's in the most inspiring is, um, my, my family, uh, my grandma is very inspirational to me. She is, I don't know, I don't think I've, I've kept count. It's probably been 12 years or 13 years survivor of ovarian cancer. Um, she lived through and survived a lot of rigorous treatments. Um, she didn't really complain. Um, she's the reason why I got into healthcare. So she's always been very inspirational to me. And I think that's because of that it's inspired me to help others. Um, you know, great healthcare individuals took care of my grandmother. I want to be that healthcare professional that takes care of, takes care of others, loved ones. And then just my, my family, um, grateful for the opportunity. My parents, um, they worked their butt off literally 24 seven every single day, uh, to give me a better life. So, their work ethic has definitely um, inspired me to work hard every day. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Hey, thanks, Tony. Really, really excited and uh, appreciate your time and having me on here. Now that you're done listening to the podcast, why don't you come over and check out my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash BrianFungRx or ImproRx. Uh, I talk about a lot of things related to pharmacy, postgraduate training in pharmacy, residencies, fellowships, and other topics, especially related to pharmacy informatics. Uh, so we'd we'll love to see you there. Come check it out. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. Hash 